welcome back to my channel and you're watching The Brown Feminist. So in today's video, we will be discussing how you can become a full-fledged biomedical research scientist in Canada. So without further ado, let's dive in and take a look at how the career trajectory works for this field. Let's get into it. In order to become a biomedical research scientist, there are two main trajectories that you can take. One is to go through academia and one is to go through industry. I'll explain what each of these mean. So first of all, let's understand what a biomedical research scientist is. It's somebody who is fully in charge of a research lab, who gets to conduct their own research projects, write their own grants, raise their own research funding, and who's basically in charge of guiding a team of researchers to further the goal of their personal research interests. And usually their personal research interests have to align closely with the place that they're working at, for example, the government or an academic research institute. So your research interests would have to align with where you are working as well. And your broad idea, okay, in the next 10 years, I wanna really dive in and study X, Y, and Z. You would be implementing that research through running a research laboratory and running your research team. So a lot of management there. Now, this is what a biomedical research scientist does. Now, when we say biomedical, this can include a lot of different fields that require wet lab research, which means in a wet environment, on the bench, doing experiments by hand, that kind of research usually falls under basic science or biomedicine. So talking about biomedical research, you can be thinking about an immunologist or a biochemist, or a microbiologist, a geneticist, a surgical immunologist. Like there's lots of different branches of this, right? A cellular molecular biologist. All of these are examples of biomedical research scientists. So how do you really conduct your research? How do you really get up to that position to become a full-fledged scientist? Let's take a look. So of course, like any other field of work, it would have to start off right when you're a student in undergrad. When you're selecting your programs, you would most likely have to dive in and do a major in something like biology, biochemistry, cellular biology, molecular medicine, or any of these things. Otherwise, there are some people who come in from the clinical world. So they can come in from things like medicine or other allied health fields and then later do a master's and a PhD in this field as well. So if step one, the most traditional route would be to do your undergraduate degree as a bachelor's of science or an honors bachelor's of science. Step two would be to graduate with really good grades and some summer research experiences and maybe a little research project as an honor student and getting into grad school. So in grad school, you would be expected to do a master's degree. You can also do a lot of direct entry PhDs, which are less common in Canada and more common in the United States. Or you can actually do a master's degree. And then while you're doing it, you can upgrade your degree to a PhD. But either way, that doctorate degree is very important, especially in academia. Now, once you have your PhD degree, <laughs> don't worry, your work is not done. You only have three degrees and you're only about in your late 20s or early 30s. So at this point, you're going to be starting your real hands-on training in a bit more of a leadership role. During your master's and PhD, you're usually under a university supervisor who is the scientist and you've been conducting your experiments in a lab. You've been presenting it to a committee, coming back to your supervisor again and again on a weekly or monthly basis for feedback and input on how to design this, how to work on this, what else you can do, what else you can try. After that is when you start your postdoctoral fellowship training. So in academia, a postdoctoral fellow can work for a minimum of one to two years and usually an upper end of like four to five years. So overall, let's look at an average of four years of training after your doctorate, doctorate degree, which is why it's called a postdoctoral fellowship. When you're doing that, you're a little bit more independent. The supervisor or the scientist trusts you a little bit more. They let you order what you need 
they let you give less frequent updates if necessary they let you kind of run with smaller things and only ask you to kind of come and ask for approval for more bigger decisions so you are definitely in charge of a lot more you don't have the worry that i have to finish a degree you're not paying tuition you're working but salaries are still pretty low at this point so after you have done your postdoctoral training, hopefully at one or two different prestigious institutes to kind of add to your resume, like, hey, I did my postdoc here. I did my postdoc with that lab. That's also a wonderful time to be building up on your rich publications. Because your grad school, your master's and PhD were more about learning how to optimize experiments, learning how to write basic poster presentations and do basic PowerPoint presentations and maybe sneakily get in a few publication. But your PhD and your postdoc is really where you get the brunk or your the main chunk of your publications, manuscripts, try to go for higher impact papers, try to do publications as a first author. And then slowly but surely, the supervisors or the scientists in the lab are gonna start tagging along your own students with you. A postdoc is in a perfect position to actually supervise junior students like those in undergrad and masters. Now, finally, you're done with your postdoc. So what's next? Well, in most cases, after you're done with your postdoc, you can start making some good money as a research associate. So all of these years of training, this 10 years plus, 15 years plus training, was just so that you can become independent. Now, I have seen research associates work very, very independently, almost like a scientist themselves. This is basically the time that you take a burden off of your senior scientist and you start writing grants, you start designing projects, you can start hiring students in the lab, all under the light and gentle supervision of the scientist. And within a few short years, you're actually ready to start applying to academic positions, whether it's uh, as an associate professor, assistant professor, such and such. You can actually do that starting from your postdoctoral time as well. But I have mostly seen people do that more in the RA positions. And once all of that is done, you're ready to become a junior scientist and work your way up to senior scientists. Parallelly, while you're doing your PhD and postdoc, you should also start a little bit of teaching on the side, maybe one or two courses here and there for the university that you're affiliated with. By the time you're an RA, a research associate, you should have quite a few courses under your wing. You've actually dealt with a lot of undergrads, maybe even teaching something at the grad school level. You're having your own grants and your own projects, your own students. So you're basically being in an apprenticeship kind of environment to then bloom and become a full-fledged scientist right after. So that was it. This was the million step procedure of how to become a research scientist. But that is not the only way. So this is the most traditional way, as I was telling you, of how I've seen people do it. With an honors bachelor's of sciences, or a normal bachelor's of sciences, with a master of science, with a PhD in science or in philosophy, but essentially in the field that you want to work in, with a postdoctoral fellowship, with a research associateship, a junior scientist, and eventually a senior scientist. Maybe even the director or chair of a research program, huh? Now let's look at less traditional methods of becoming a research scientist. Lots of people, like I was saying, come in from allied health fields. For example, med uh, clinicians like um, an MD, an MD PhD holding individual can also come in, which means if you are going to med school, you could have applied to an MD PhD directly, which is very, very rare and extremely prestigious in Canada which means you would be doing a combination of medical school and PhD all together in one program. I think it has about five or six years span. So you do like three years med school, three years this, and then you graduate with your MD PhD. Um, and then you can also do your medicines done, your MD is done, your licensing and everything is done. And as you're working, you wanna do some research. So you do an, a PhD on the side, or you're just an MD, but you still have the right to run a lab as long as you have some basic understanding. So I've actually seen a lot more doctors not opt for the PhD, but just do a master's on the side so they have a basic understanding of research methods. And that is sufficient in combination with their MD to allow them to have their own research lab. 
and this is especially true for like physicians who are in fields like infectious diseases and such where they're obviously handling the clinical aspect of things they've all obviously done all their residency and training and now they're adding on either a master's or a phd for that basic understanding of research and they can usually apply to become a researcher a clinician scientist is what they're called so that was the less traditional way of getting ahead and doing your path and your journey to become a, a biomedical research scientist. Even though this kind of non-traditional approach is most commonly seen amongst physicians who then come and do like a secondary research degree or just physicians without that research degree, we have also been seeing a rise in nurse practitioners and other allied health professionals who are actually coming in and starting to get those PI positions. So while it's still rare, we're still hopeful that that aspect will grow as well. So we have your research scientists, you have your um, clinician scientists, and those are like the traditional and the slightly non-traditional ways of becoming a biomedical research scientist. So in terms of being an MD, PhD or an MD who wants to run it, there's a lot of physician led research. Not all of it is covered in this video today because not all of the research that physicians do are biomedical laboratory based research. Physicians are also very often involved in clinical research, which is a topic we're not going to deal in this video, but I have a bunch of other videos where I have talked about it. So I'm just linking them below in the description. Do check them out if you're interested. Apart from that, there's obviously different kinds of scientists who are not biomedical research scientists, for example, clinical epidemiologists and such, who are also kind of scientists. But they're not necessarily going to be covered in our video because today we're talking about people who get in charge of a laboratory. Now let's go and discuss what happens in industry. So this was academia where you go ahead, you do all your degrees, you do all your teachings on the side, or you do your clinical work on the side and you eventually become a research scientist. The lucky thing is that this is not the same thing when it comes to industry. So industry is usually like a pharmaceutical company or other kind of privately owned like biotech company and other like companies which are interested in discovering cures or like finding out other things. So there obviously you can still be a scientist without all of this training. I have seen people in Canada with a master's degree and a ton of experience become scientists. I have seen people do a master's degree, a PhD degree, not do a postdoc and also go in and climb up industry. So industry has a mix of flavors. It has some parts which are like academia and then it has other flavors which are more similar to the corporate world. So the way that I find industry similar to the corporate world is because as long as you have the talent, you're showing the results, you're showing your efficiency by completing projects, meeting targets, publishing and such, you can climb up the ladder. There is not a lot of academic degree requirement bound reasons for you not to be promoted. As long as you can demonstrate, even with a master's degree, you are able to deliver what a postdoc would have delivered, you can still get that position. You can become a scientist, a senior scientist in industry without all of these degree requirements. Now, the bad part about um, that I personally don't love about industry is that you don't always get to control what you're doing research on. So in academia, as long as it's a field you are in charge of and you have a personal interest in it, and you see that the department has funding for it or the department where you're working at or allied with that research institution or that university also supports this kind of thing of research. As long as those needs are met, you can basically take any angle on your research project, go a little bit more towards viruses or a little bit more towards microbiology, as long as you can satisfy some very loose requirements within the department. Having said that, in industry, you have a cut out, well mapped goal that you need to fulfill, right? Because industry, for example, is getting a lot of investment top down and they're going to explore XYZ viruses in the next five years. And they're going to maybe come up with a vaccine or they're going to maybe run clinical trials on it. So they're going to hand you the overall corporate goal of trying to investigate if maybe a cure can be found or if some drug can be improved, if some kind of better delivery systems can be created for pharma. Um, and then you will be handed that project and then you can find ways of doing it the best. But you cannot necessarily move away from the overall decisions that come top down from the corporate part of that industry. 
So there is a little bit of a different frame, although you can move between projects. So if you don't enjoy a certain kind of research and if the organization is large enough, it might be possible for you to move to a different branch or to a different project, to a different um, kind of program within that industry. However, typically, if you are where you are, you can't really choose, no, you know what? There's nothing more to look here. I'm gonna go look at that virus because that seems really cool. And I'm an immunologist. You usually can't just do that. Um, you do have to look at the overarching goals of the organization and what it had sought and promised the people or the corporation heads and at least do your due diligence of exploring it and demonstrating in your report what you're finding. And based on that, further decisions are going to be taken regarding like manufacturing, patenting and lots of other things. So that, that lifestyle is actually significantly different from academia. Academia's goal is purely for knowledge and exploration and adding to the body of knowledge of science and findings. While in industry, there is another goal. You have to kind of prove or disprove and then move on and then maybe implement in clinical trials, maybe do translation research so if something can be brought as a product to the population and can be marketed. So there are lots of other aspects of industry as well. For the few friends of mine who do work in industry, every, for example, math that you're doing to arrive at your decision, every microgram, milligram measurements, they have to be very specific because they might be audited, they might be checked, they have to do quality control because this is going to be very likely going to become a product. On the other hand, in academia, a lot more basic science research would need to be done. And even if it was going to translation projects, it wouldn't be done by the same organization. So that was it for today's video. I really hope you've enjoyed it and that I was able to show you a clear map of how you can become a biomedical research scientist and run your own lab someday as a scientist. So just a summary, let's go through the three ways that you can do it. The most traditional way being going into academia, doing your bachelor's in science, master's in science, PhD, postdoctoral fellowship, RA ship, and eventually a scientist while also being involved in academia and teaching. Number two was when we were talking about how clinicians can enter the field with their nurse practitioner's degree, MDs, and other kinds of clinical degrees, like clinical epi, for example, and they can come in and they can actually um, do a small master's or PhD super quick to get their research training, and they can have their own lab as well, in which case, most likely, they're gonna be hiring RAs to look at the more specific research aspects of it. Number three, we actually talked about how you can become a full-fledged research scientist without needing all of these degrees if you don't go to academia and instead you go to industry. For industry, the degree requirements are a lot more loose, but the actual expectation of efficiency is a lot more high. So people with just a master's degree can also become a senior scientist, with just a PhD can become a research scientist without needing like 20 years of experience, as long as you are able to demonstrate that you have the publication, you have the technical knowledge, and you can definitely do it, you can definitely lead a lab. So these were the three main ways in which you can actually become a biomedical research scientist in Canada. If I've missed out anything, please do let me know in the comment section down below and I'll be sure to add them in a future video. So that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to subscribe, please. Okay, bye.